Hello and good evening. Um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of m and members, Markets and Morality members, and our co-sponsors, uh, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, the St. Benedict's Institute, and the Latino Student Organization. Um, we are very thankful to both our in-person and virtual audience joining us for what is sure to be a very memorable discussion. Uh, my name is Brian Nwelly, and I am a first-year member, a first first-year member of Markets and Morality. When I first joined Markets and Morality, I was added to a rather eclectic group of people, um, but who, despite our differences, all shared something in common, sh something very important. That was a, an unspoken yet deep commitment to pursuing truth. Um, so together, we explore not just economics, but a breadth of disciplines, ranging from philosophy, culture, uh, religion, politics, and everything, all the big questions in between. Um, and in that same, and the spirit that both unites us as a group and gives life to this broad pursuit is the historic Christian faith. And so to those who are wondering about the inner workings, um, Markets and Morality is at, at its heart, at its core, a book club. But unlike many book clubs, the books and the arguments and the, the passages all come alive during our discussions uh, as we use them as roadmaps to both deepen and unravel our beliefs, our values, our ideas. And in the same spirit, we we travel to and we host speakers who, who push us and move us to, to kind of dispel this false dichotomy that we so often hold of, of knowledge versus experience. We understand, we understand intellectual inquiry and the ability to empathize, the ability to, to understand another's views and to, to share those views as two things that go hand in hand, that are companions, that are inextricably linked. And hence, our theme for this year was fittingly intellectual empathy. To, this evening, we're going to have the chance to practice this by listening and hearing two personal testimonies from Miguel Labrantes and Mr. Am Amaures Rodriguez Matos, both Cuban refugees. Dr. Abrahantes is a professor of engineering and department chair at Hope College. He received his engineering doctorate in control systems from the Universidad Nacional del Sur in Argentina in 2000. That same year, Professor Abrahantes was resettled in West Michigan by a refugee agency and has been teaching at Hope since 2003. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez Matos was a university professor in Cuba and before coming to the U.S. in December 2016 um, with his wife and four children. Uh, the Rodriguez Matos family came into the U.S. just in time to qualify under the Cuban Haitian Entry Program, which is a program uh, geared towards refugees from these countries. Uh, the family was sponsored by St. Francis de Sales uh, Church in Holland, received housing initially from Grace Episcopal Church and has since been the recipient of a Habitat for Humanity home in Holland. I think I speak for everyone in this room by saying that we're very grateful that, the West Michigan, that West Michigan has become a home to both these men and their families. Uh, before they share their stories, I will give the floor to Professor Estelle. Uh, professor Estelle is Associate uh, Professor of Economics, the Founding Director of Markets and Morality, and will be moderating our discussion tonight. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you, Brian, and um, thank you all for being here this evening. I have a couple notes of logistics before we get to our speakers this evening. Um, one is that if you want to learn some more about markets and morality, there is a table in the back with some cool stickers, some free books, and afterwards, some of our members to speak with you. Um, but even more importantly, I know you want to hear from these folks. So I want to let you know how you can get your questions answered. We'll be using a free website, slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O 
www.cubaclinic.com, and all you need is the code CUBA. Uh, and so our speakers are prepared to know that if we're looking at our cell phones or our smart devices or laptops, it might be that we, hopefully, it's that we're submitting questions and we'll have time to um, answer those later. Um, I'll also say that I will not do half as good of a job as Brian did in pronouncing these good men's names. Uh, Miguel has been my colleague for some time, and last week I realized I've been adding a, an extra syllable to his name the whole time, so I'm so sorry, Miguel. Professor Ebrentes. Close? Okay. Gosh. <laughs> and Mr. Mr. Rodriguez, it's so lovely to have you here. So we want to start with your personal testimonies. Can you tell us about your life in Cuba and your decision to come and experience coming to the United States? Thank you. And thank you, the, the student from Market and Morality, to select this topic and invite us to talk. And thank you to everyone that are here. We are honored to be here. Um, when I was asked to talk, I would say, well, my story is getting old since I came here to West Michigan uh, 21 years ago, um, before most of the students here, I hope, were born. <laughs> then, <laughs> then I've been here in West Michigan for a long time now. But then I think, well, I can talk about my story, start from the beginning of the revolution, and my family kind of setting um, the stage for, for you to understand the situation in Cuba today, and if you have any question, of course, we can go from, from there. But um, um, I originally from Cuba, like this is where here, and I was born in the center of the island, the region called the Escambray. Um, it's the region, it's a mountain region um, where the, um, the last battle of the revolution was organized by Che Guevara in the area that I was born. Um, my family, um, two families uh, ha were farmers' families. My mother's um, family um, have um, coffee plantations in the mountains where the um, the coffee uh, grows underneath the canopy of the, um, the rainforest, and that's where they have their plantation. My father family have a farm in the bottom of the, the hill, um, more for tobacco, sugar cane, and those. Um, and um, like I say, that was the area that I was born. A small farm, you have to think that in Cuba they had to work, labor the land with horses or oxes. Uh, and you cannot have a big, when I say plantation or farm, it's a very small piece. And um, when, like that area was the area that was used to plant one of the battles of the revolution. After the revolution um, took power, the same area then was used for the rebels that were fighting against the new regime. Um, after Fidel Castro announced that Cuba was a socialist revolution, many um, Cubans that fought with Fidel to restore democracy then started to fight against Fidel. And that was the area that I, I grew up. Then um, my Mother family was in the mountains, and one day during the fight, the Revolutionary Army arrived. They were taking all of the farmers to um, encampments and farther from the area that we would live to avoid helping the rebels. And they took her, my grandfather and the family. My grandfather was wearing the clothes that he was farming, and they were taken away in the pickup truck. Um, my mother was begging the driver to let them go because it was a really difficult situation at that time. They, they were having a um, summary execution of the rebels. If somebody said by any reason that my grandfather helped the rebels, he would be 
executed uh, right there, the same day, the mock trial were in the cemetery with the grave already dug. And my mother opened the door of the car, told the driver that she would jump, and then the driver slowed down. My grandfather jumped and ran into the woods. Then they, the driver let my mother and my aunt and my grandmother go. They hide until the end of the, the conflict. And at that time, after that, my mother and my father get married and they open a um, convenient store in the corner. It's a bodega um, in, in the city of Cienfuegos, very close to the Escambray. And the house that I was born was in the corner, the, ha the same building of the bodega. The house was pointing in one street, the bodega and the other street. And <clears throat> Like I said, the revolution now was a socialist revolution. When the re revolution started to implement the tenets of the socialism, one thing that they did start was that uh, the means of production had to be uh, in the hands of the government. And then one day, a soldier knocked the door of the store and told my father that from that day, the, <clears throat> the store was a um, property of the government. And he had to work in the store until the soldier knew how to run the store. Mm. Then he, he stayed there for a while. When he was let go, he bought a car to drive as a taxi driver, to work as a taxi driver. But the, the revolution started with the big companies. They nationalized the big companies. They started with small business. And at the end, the taxi driver was a means of production as well. And he was stopped in the street, had to walk away from the car, and he had to work as a taxi driver, working with a Russian car, a Lada, that was the name. And um, the government started to use his car, which was one of the, maybe one of the cars that you can see on the pictures because it was a Chevrolet from the 50s. And <clears throat> then that is in the time that I grew up. I went to college in the, at the end of the 80s, graduated in 93, the time that um, Europe was going through the, um, the Berlin Wall was being knocked down, the curtain, the iron curtain was down, and we were very helpful that Cuba will be next, but um, never happened. And um, when I graduated in 93, I was trying to do everything possible to, to leave the country. In 94, we have, Bill Clinton was the president of the United States, Fidel Castro in Cuba, and they have one of the spark that they typically had. Fidel Castro said that he wouldn't, um, care a lot about Cuban leaving the island. And at that time, then a group of friends that graduated with me, and I was 23, 24, we decided to leave the Cuba using an inflatable raft and a small motor. And, but even when the government was not uh, going after people that was leaving, the police found the motor in the car of my friends, and I was in a different car, and they got the, the motor. We decided not to leave without the motor, uh, but at that time, they were sending the Cubans that were arriving here, or arriving to the Coast Guard that was protecting Florida to Guantanamo Bay base and Panama base. At that time, U.S. had a base in Panama. and. Um, I didn't leave, but then my family put together. It was a really hard situation to see my brother and I trying to live in the raft. And we start to, to work. Since in my family is originally from Spain, my grandfather was born in Spain. Then our family start to try to do the paperwork for us to get the Spanish citizenship and then go to Spain. Then in the embassy of Spain, I find out about scholarships 
to do graduate school, that's when I apply. And I went to Argentina. I get a fellowship to, to go to Argentina. It's a long story how I was able to leave and get the permission to leave Cuba, but when I was in Argentina, it's when the United States admit me as a refugee, gave me the permission to come here. Then I arrived in Miami, and I was sent to Grand Rapids. There was no Google map or iPhone at that time when they told me, you are going to Grand Rapids. I didn't know where it was Grand Rapids. <laughs> yeah, I knew there was Michigan when they told me, and they, they put a sticker to say, I don't speak English, help me. <laughs> they gave me the ticket, and a group of Cubans filed us a ride to Grand Rapids. A Calvin College student picked us up in the airport, and a, a church, a reformed church in Wyoming, in Grand Rapids, a, kind of sponsor us, help us with the initial papers and resettling. I was going to Garabi Public School full time for English as a second language. From eight in the morning, around two, two o'clock, I drove to a second chef factory job, a Lax Enterprise. That's accompanied by the airport in Grand Rapids. I worked there for a few months until I knew some English <laughs> that I was able to apply for a position with my degree. Then I went to Indiana University. I was at Indiana University for a year. But at that time, I already met the one that is my wife now. Then I came back to Grand Rapids to work at uh, Davenport University. I met my wife here in West Michigan in one Catholic retreat for youth single before internet <laughs> meeting the old fashioned way in, the, in a retreat by the lake. And then I came back to um, West Michigan. I worked in Davenport University for a couple of years. And then I met um, Professor John Krapset that was working with an um, um, intro to engineering course like he's doing here with most of you. And when the opportunity opened, he asked me to join Hope. And I, I joined Hope in 2003 as a part-time and four as a full-time. And I've been teaching the same course. I have a few students here, but that is how I get here. Uh, now I will translate for Amaris. Amaris has been here five years, but I uh, yeah, have no time to learn English, and <laughs> he's not feeling comfortable to speak <laughs> in English to the big group. And he gave me some notes that I translate before, and I can read what he's going to be reading, and then we can just have the conversation, I would translate for him uh, the best that I can. <laughs> Let me get my, the note. Thank you so much. Um, you can use the microphone. <laughs> Oops, I said in English. <laughs> but, uh, sorry. Bueno, reitero, eh, muy buenas noches. Mi nombre es Amaury Rodríguez, estoy acompañado por mi esposa Yuslady Daniel. Y, y es para mí de una gran significación estar aquí esta noche con ustedes por, por, por el tema que se está tratando y por lo que se está viviendo en Cuba en estos momentos. Muchas gracias. He just introduced himself, his wife, and he thank you for all to be here. That was no part of the introduction that I have. Bueno, soy cubano. Como todos saben, vivo en Haaland junto a mi familia desde hace ya cinco años. 
mi esposa y cuatro hijos llegamos a esta ciudad en una significativa fecha, un 24 de diciembre de 2016. Antes, pasamos por la terrible experiencia de estar separados por más de cuatro años, ellos viviendo en Cuba, yo en Brasil, país donde estuve exiliado y al que me fui debido a las diferencias políticas e ideológicas de un sistema que asfixia cualquier intento de oposición política, mucho más en la educación universitaria. Good evening. My name is Amaris Rodriguez Matos. I am Cuban and I have lived in Holland with my family for five years. My wife and I have four children and arrived in this city on a very significant date, December 24, 2016. Before that, we had the terrible experience of being separated for more than four years. They were living in Cuba and I was living in Brazil. I was living in exile in Brazil due to the political and ideological differences with the Cuban government. Cuban government suffocated any attempt of political opposition, much more in the higher education settings. Mis diferencias políticas y dificultades con el gobierno y con la universidad estuvieron dadas en el ejercicio de mi propia profesión. Las críticas, sean cuales sean, el gobierno no las torera y a quien critique lo ve como un enemigo. My political difference with the government and with the college system were evident in the experience of my own profession as college professor. Criticism, whatever it may be, the government does not tolerate, and whoever criticizes, they seem as enemy. La presión docente y académica no se hizo esperar. Democracia, libertad de expresión, pluralidad de idea no son consustanciales al socialismo y particularmente en el caso Cuba están penalizadas hasta por la constitución que refiere que el socialismo es irrevocable y todo cuanto se haga en contra de eso es penado por ley. The pressure about academics and teaching was direct. Democracy, freedom of expression, plurality of ideas is not compatible with socialism, and particular in the case with Cuba, where the Constitution states that the socialism is irrevocable and everything that is done against it is punishable by law. Al finalizar mis estudios de especialista en estrategias educativas para la educación superior, antes había concluido mi maestría en estudios sociales y psicología social. Obtuve una beca de doctorado en Sociología por la Universidad Federal de Paraná en Brasil y me fue negado por las autoridades cubanas. Mm. At the end of my studies, in, especially in education strategies for higher education, I have previously completed my master's degree in social studies and social psychology. I obtained a PhD scholarship in sociology from the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil, and I was denied by the Cuban authority. Mm -hmm. Renuncié a mi puesto de profesor auxiliar de la universidad y como represalia me prohibieron salir del país alegando que yo poseía información clasificada de gobierno. I resigned from my position as assistant professor at the university, and in retaliation they banned me from leaving the country on the grounds that I possess classified government information. Tras gestiones de amigos y colegas, pude salir en febrero del 2012. Perdí mi beca de doctorado, pero la adversidad de estar en un país extranjero y todo cuanto eso supone, mi mayor fortaleza estaba en mi familia ausente. After friends and college intercede, I, I was able to leave in February 2012. I lost my doctoral scholarship, but despite the adversity of being in the foreign country, and all that entitled, I, uh, my greatest strength was my accent, my accent family. Comencé impartiendo clases de español en escuelas privadas. <coughs> la Universidad Federal de Paraná me ayudó dándome la categoría de profesor visitante y también trabajé como recepcionista nocturno del Hotel Aymoré Palace, del que luego fui manager general. I started teaching Spanish in private school, the Federal University of Paraná helped me by giving me the category of visiting professor. I also work as night receptionist at the 
Aymar Palace Hotel, where I later became the general manager. Mi viaje a Cuba a visitar a mi familia era motivo de preocupación para el régimen cubano. Los agentes de la seguridad del Estado me visitaban para presionarme y alertarme de represalia si me manifestaba en contra del gobierno. My trips to Cuba to visit my family were a matter of concern for the Cuban regime. Cuba state security agents visited me to put pressure on me and warn our reprisals if I demonstrate against the government. Un país así no quería para mis hijos y poco a poco y durante cuatro años desde Brasil fui preparando la salida de mi familia de Cuba. Tuve que trabajar intensamente y ahorrar al máximo para lograr mi objetivo en el menor tiempo posible. Brasil, Uruguay, Chile, Estados Unidos eran de mi interés para vivir junto a ellos. I did not want such a country for my children. Little by little, during four years in Brazil, I was preparing my family's departure from Cuba. I had to work hard and save as much as possible to achieve my goal in the short amount of time. Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and the United States were of interest for me to leave with my family. In January of 2016, the government of the United States me otorgó a visa for 10 years. In March of 2016, I visited the United States. Quería conocer el país en el cual aspiraba a vivir junto a mi familia. Yo podía derivar mi visa a mi esposa e hijo, pero tenían que vivir un mínimo de seis meses conmigo y ser residentes en Brasil. En January 2016, the United States government grant me a 10-year visa. In March 2016, I visited the U.S. I wanted to get to know the country where I aspired to live with my family. I could... I could refer my wife and children to my visa, but for that they had to live with me a minimum of six months in Brazil. Comencé todo un proceso largo y costoso para una reunificación familiar en Brasil. En medio de estos preparativos, en abril del 2016, nos llegó a la vida a nuestra hija más pequeña y fue motivo mayor de inspiración y decisión para venirnos como emigrados a Estados Unidos. I started a long, uh, expensive process for my family reunification in Brazil. In the midst of all that preparation, in April 2016, our youngest daughter was born, and it was a major reason of inspiration and helped the decision to come to emigrate to the United States. In August of that same year, I was invited to an event of sociology of the University of Monterrey to celebrate in December, and that permitted that the Embajada of Mexico in La Habana le otorgar a mi familia visa de turismo para acompañarme al evento. In August of the same year, I was invited to sociology event at University of Monterrey to be held in December, and I allowed the Embassy of Mexico in Havana, Cuba, to grant my family a tourist visa to accompany to the event. Fue la gran oportunidad que tuvimos de viajar hasta la ciudad de Monterrey presentarnos ante las autoridades de inmigración de Estados Unidos en la ciudad de Laredo y solicitar asilo político el 20 de diciembre de 2016. It was a great opportunity. They, we have to travel to the city of Monterrey, appear before the United States Immigration Authorities in the city of Laredo and request political asylum on December 20, 2016. Eh, desde antes, estudié mucho acerca de las mejores ciudades de los Estados Unidos para vivir con niños y en Holland encontré una ciudad que desde lo, virtu desde lo virtual y desde esos mecanismos de investigación informática que uno establece eh, me daba confianza. Since before I, I study a lot about the best cities in the U.S. to live with children and in Holland I found a city that based on my online uh, readings it gave me confidence. Los índices de desarrollo humano que reflejaba la ciudad en los diversos informes, investigaciones y resúmenes de contenido sociológico que estudiaba daban cuenta de que era una ciudad que cumplía con mis expectativas. The Human Development Index that the city reflects in the various reports, investigation and summary of sociological content that I studied showed that it was a city that met my expectations. Debo confesarle que la realidad ha superado todas mis expectativas. Y estamos muy felices de vivir en esta maravillosa ciudad. 
desde nuestra llegada a la ciudad, estuvimos atendidos por un comité para la atención a refugiados creado por las iglesias San Francis de Sales y Grace Episcopal. I must confess that the reality has far exceeded my expectation and we are very happy to live in this wonderful city. Since our arrival in Holland, we have been assessed by the Committee for Refugee Care created by uh, San Francis of uh, Sales and a um, Grace Episcopal Church. Este comité estuvo dirigido por un profesor de esta alta casa de estudio, el doctor Richard Ray, y inmensamente feliz porque al llegar aquí me encontré a dos de las coordinadoras también de ese comité, Sister Noelia y Donna Nova. Gracias por acompañarnos. This committee was directed by the professor from Hope College, Dr. Richard Ray, and he's also grateful for the presence of the the two other members of the committee that are here. La manera en que nos acogieron, la ayuda para comprender procesos y poco a poco irnos insertando en esta sociedad fue determinante y muy apreciado por nosotros. The way that we were welcome, um, the help to understand the process and gradually insert ourselves into the society was decisive and highly appreciated by us. Nuestros hijos obtienen excelentes resultados docentes y deportivos. Le van yendo a la vida de manera integral en su formación. Mi esposo y yo trabajamos en una compañía en la ciudad de Silan. Infelizmente no me llevo muy bien con el idioma. Pienso que debo y tengo que dedicarle un mayor tiempo, pero toda nuestra prioridad ha estado enfocada en nuestros niños. Our children have obtained excellent results academically and in sports. This is going to be an integral part of their formation. My wife and I work in a company in the city of Silan. Unfortunately, I don't get along very well with the language. I would like to dedicate more time to it, but all our priority has been focused in our children. In August of the past year, we were benefited with the program of Habitat for Humanity and received a house. The oldest of our children is part of the program of Upperbaum. Approximately, he will enter university. La mayor de las niñas y el segundo varón están en middle school y la más pequeña en el grado kinder de la Jefferson Elementary. In August last year, we benefited from the uh, Habitat for Humanity program and we received our own house. The oldest of our children is part of the Upward Bound program. He will soon enter college. The oldest of the girls and the youngest of the boy uh, are in middle school and the youngest is in kindergarten and Jefferson Elementary. No hemos estado alejados de los problemas y crisis que se viven en Cuba. Vivimos constantemente preocupados por nuestros familiares que aún viven allí. En un término de tres años han sido acogidos por este maravilloso país cerca de 20 familiares nuestros, los cuales por razones políticas y económicas se vieron en la necesidad de emigrar. We have not been away from the problems and crisis that are experience in Cuba. We live constantly worried about our relatives who still live there. In a time frame of three years, about 20 of our relatives have been welcomed by this wonderful country, which for political and economic reasons, they have made the decision to emigrate. Albergo la esperanza de que un día Cuba respire aires de libertad y sea en realidad un país con todos y para el bien de todos. I hope um, I hold the hope that one day Cuba will breath, breathe the air of freedom and will actually be a country with everyone and for the good of all. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Perdón, si en algún momento se me quiebra la voz, es que el trauma, la separación de la familia, no lo supero todavía. Han pasado cinco años y todavía duele. <laughs> he's asking, um, um, feel sorry that he's feeling emotional, and then he made me emotional. <laughs> but he has been thinking in the family in Cuba, all of these things. That was actually what I wanted to ask next. Um, you both have family still in Cuba right now, and Mr. Rodriguez um, 
We understand that you have a number of family members that have been able to join us in the United States just in the last few months. What should we know about what's going on in Cuba now? Yeah. No. You go ahead. I, he gave it some prepared note, but I will just translate what he will say because it's going to be too long. Sí, nos quedan familia. Eh, tomemos en cuenta que normalmente la familia en Cuba, eh, bueno, nuestra familia, no vamos a hablar de la familia en Cuba, particularmente nuestra familia es numerosa. It's just talk about that in Cuba generally are very big families. Yeah, we have big families. Queda mi madre, el padre de mi esposa. He had um, his mother, the father of the wife. Tres de mis hermanos y uno de ellas con su respectiva familia. Three siblings of him and the wife. Y, y ahorita le me refería que en tres años hemos recibido un, un total de, de 20 familiares nuestros, pero recientemente y a raíz de los sucesos de julio pasado, acabados de llegar hace apenas un mes, cumplieron hoy, en diferentes días más o menos, tenemos siete en casa. He is talking about how in the last three years, 20 other relatives have come, but he just wanted to mention that in the last couple of weeks, seven. Have, have arrived and they are all in his house. <laughs> Seven nieces and nephews, <laughs> all young, after them, they left after the protest that happened last year and the, the government crackdown of, of the protesters. What was after the family? <laughs> family and um, also what's going on in, in Cuba now? Some discussion perhaps of the most recent. What is what is what is happening? Oh. In the traduction. No. Okay. Bueno, eh, primeramente lo que está pasando en Cuba es un el resultado de una pésima gestión de gobierno que como estandarte internacional ha, ha, ha usado el gobierno para el bienestar humano y en la práctica no ha sido así. And one of the main reasons of the situation in Cuba is for the mismanagement of the country by people that are supposed to predicate that they were being just and social. But... Uh, all the is the opposite. <laughs> yeah, eh, Cuba vive en una carencia terrible, falta de medicamentos, alimentos, eh, procesos materiales para el desarrollo de los procesos científicos y tecnológicos, y evidentemente hay una crisis de gobierno que es política, que es económica y que es social. Cuba lacked of material things for all levels, not only for the scientific part, but food, medicine, and it's, it's in a deep um, political, social, and economic crisis. De lo más reciente, de lo más reciente eh, sucedido en Cuba, están los sucesos y todo lo que ha devenido, pero que tuvo su epicentro, el núcleo, el 11 de julio del pasado año. Uh, Cuba, one of the, the main points of the crisis have been focused in what happened in last year, July 11. Mm -hmm. yeah. el, el pueblo salió a las calles en manifestaciones que en principio fueron pacíficas y que luego se fueron tornando un poco más graves. Uh, it was um, the Cuban people get out of the street to protest, they were mostly peaceful, but at the end, they start to get out of hand. Mm -hmm. El socialismo cubano dice que cualquier manifestación de tipo pública tiene que ser autorizada. 
y si no lo es, entonces es ilegal. The, the, Cuban, the socialist Cuban regime says that any meeting in Cuba has to be authorized by the government. Eh, de manera tal que fueron encarcelados más de 1.300 ciudadanos cubanos. So more, more than 1,300 Cubans uh, were put in jail after that meeting. Hasta the, el momento se le han hecho juicio a 300, 793. To this moment they have 793 Cubans have go to a trial. For that. Y de ellos 58 son niños menores de edad. And 58 of them are minors. Niños que están enfrentando penas a la cárcel como si fueran adultos. Uh, minors that have been tried as an adult. Tengamos en cuenta que Cuba es el país que tiene la mayor población carceraria de presos políticos. Just keep in mind that Cuba has one of the highest um, population of political prisoners. Los juicios no tuvieron el debido proceso. Eh, se le aplicaron eh, cargos a estos jóvenes y a estos niños que en realidad ellos no habían cometido. Y si sí hubo algunos que estuvieron debidamente identificados porque transgredieron espacios como el romper cristales de una tienda para llevarse alimentos y esas cosas. Um, most of the trials didn't have the due process and most of them were charged with things that were not actually the reality. And very few Cubans broke glasses or went into any store. Y viene la pregunta, ¿cuál es el bienestar del pueblo del que habla el socialismo cubano? ¿Dónde está el humanismo que defiende el socialismo cubano? Si una persona se ve en la obligación de robar para comer. And there is the question, where is the Cuban, um, the social element when Cubans that um, steal to eat go to jail? Los familiares que tenemos en casa y otros tantos amigos y familiares de amigos que están hoy en Cuba y que han llegado a este país recientemente, eh, casi todos participaron en, en las manifestaciones del 11 de julio. Most of the, his nieces and nephews that are with him uh, were part of the rallies in Havana before coming here. Y la... Y, y, lo que, y lo que ha sucedido realmente es que hoy se está dando un, un, una, una, un éxodo, hay una crisis eh, de, de, migra, de, de migración. Uh -huh. eh, lo, la patrulla fronteriza de los Estados Unidos y inmigración declararon hace unos días, en la semana pasada, en un día se registraron 1.500 cubanos siendo aceptados en el país, en un solo día. 1,500 cubanos fueron aceptados en los Estados Unidos huyendo del tardocastrismo cubano, del régimen cubano. Um, it's mentioned that, uh, that this has produced a massive exodus from Cubans. And just in the last two, day, two weeks, the immigration of the United States have um, said that more than a thousand Cubans have crossed the border in one day. In one day? In one day? One day, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. La semana one. pasada, el, el, el martes de la semana pasada. 1,500 in one day. Yeah. Y resumiendo, doctora Sara, eh, lo que está pasando en Cuba es que no existe libertad de expresión. What is happening right now is that it's no. La inflación económica es imparable. The inflation and the economic situation is. Existen yeah. problemas serios con la orientación sexual, la identidad de género. They, they have issues of sexual identity and all of those as well. 
detenciones arbitrarias y encarcelamientos de corta duración sembrando una psicología del terror. They, they used um, short um, prison time to terrorize the Cubans. Um, they detained for... Falta de alimentos y medicina, hospitales con, con falta de higiene. The situation of the hospitals is, is, is very difficult, lack of materials. Calles imposible de transitar. The streets are crumbling and hard Se to travel. El problema racial. There is issues, uh, racial issues as well in Cuba. Ciudades que fueron patrimonio eh, están siendo destruidas. Cities that are, um, that are um, world heritage um, have been destroyed and crumbled. Está volviendo una práctica. Eh, no me acostumbro a esto. Okay. Eh, está, está volviendo una práctica que de años atrás, que es la coerción social y de gobierno a la, a la práctica religiosa, a la creencia religiosa y a su práctica. Yeah. Eh, he's mentioned how Cuba is going back to practice of um, the lack of freedom of religion that we were obtaining is kind of backtracking in the last time. Evidentemente los líderes religiosos están del lado del pueblo, defienden al pueblo. The religion leaders are with the people. But Pero estos a su vez están siendo coercionados por el gobierno y por las diferentes instituciones. But the government put a lot of pressure in the, in the leaders. In the Um, uh, Dr. Abrahentes, I wonder if I could ask you just to speak very briefly about how we've titled tonight's event, Cuba, Homeland and Life, and then I want to ask a question about your experience as Catholic Christians in Cuba. Um, I'm going to talk about my experience as a Catholic. Um, when I grew up the situation was even more complicated than it is now. Um, the, the priests and nuns were expelled. The, all of the priests and nuns that were uh, not born in Cuba were expelled for the Cuban government. And um, when I grew up, uh, the Catholic faith was a family affair. I never went to church until I was in the 20s. Um, the church was closed. I learned everything at home. Um, my family, uh, like my mother uh, saw a cross inside my belt because we couldn't wear the cross. Uh, we had to hide it. Uh, as I tell anyone, when I was in kindergarten or elementary school that I was Catholic, I, it would block the way for me to go to college or get any education. Um, um, I went to a school, elementary school, that was a religion, a, a Catholic school prior to the revolution. The government, um, like I said, spells the nun that was running the, the school, and the government, the day that it spelled the nun, came to the school and went into the school. In the um, apartments that were in the top, they threw their image icons and all of the books or the nan, and they made the nan to walk through the rubbles of all of their possession to a minivan to spell them. And that was the school that I went, run by the government. That, um, then it was, when I was in my 20s was when, after the Iron Curtain went down, the, the Cuban government lost the ideological control of the country that it opens a little more to, um, to the religion. And the, the Pope went to Cuba also, and then there was a big opening.
or the relation. Yep. I wonder if you'd speak a little bit about your experience as college students. We have a lot of college students here, so that would be helpful. I went, as like I said, to college in the 80s and 90s. Um, I just what is you see my transcripts, the first courses that I have in my transcripts are all about socialism. I have four courses, uh, five courses, a whole semester that is um, political economics of the socialism, political economics of the capitalism, um, <laughs> um, materialism, dialectic materialism, historic materialism, and scientific socialism. Those are courses that I had to take in college that everyone in the whole country had to take. That was the only thing that, that everyone had to take. I, I have to say I have a good education, technically I'm an engineer and the education was good in the engineer part, but also I have to go through that part. One of my professors, uh, the scientific socialism professor, <laughs> she went to Russia to get educated in Russia and she came back to Cuba with ideas of perestroika, and Glasnost was at the end of that period. And she allowed us to say something that she was not telling us to say. Because in all of the tests, I had to tell the professor what I need to say, not my opinion. It was, and she allowed us to, not to question, but to say, what do you think about this? And she was fired for doing that. One of the, one of the students in, in our class told the party and she was fired. And it was very different type of education where um, critical thinking is not part of the education. You have to repeat. In the scientific communism, I, I, we, we were asked to read Marx, Engels, and Lenin, but and we also have to know about Hegel and Smith and all of the other ones, <laughs> Ricardo, all of those, but not to compare ideas, but what Smith said that was wrong and what Lenin said that was right. And it's, it was, very, very different that the way that we are educated here and the way that you you are present. And I say, a very chunk of my education was indoctrination. Yeah, I had to regurgitate those things. But I get A in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here now. I'm here now. <laughs> the university now. Yeah, I'm doing, uh, <laughs> Didn't work with me. <laughs> no, eh, sí. Añadir a ese, añadir a ese saber. Eh, cómo, 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 por, por qué es difícil entender cómo una gran población en Cuba continúa defendiendo el socialismo y el gobierno. Is that, that it, this is one way to understand why in Cuba some people still support the regime. Y, uh, y hay diferentes condicionamientos, pero un condicionamiento muy importante es el de la vida universitaria, es el de, de lo que tú recibes en el aula. That one of those things is what, what you receive in the classroom in Cuba. What is. El pueblo cubano es un pueblo altamente formado En niveles, en sus niveles educacionales. Y te faltó una asignatura por mencionar. That the, that the Cuba people is very well educated and uh, high level of education. Ateísmo but, científico. Ah. 
scientific uh, atheist. atheist. I, I don't know. <laughs> sí, <laughs> es, es la teoría. He's talking about a, a course that I forgot to mention <laughs> that he took. <laughs> the, en la teoría uh, rusa, alemana, del socialismo utópico francés, de la filosofía clásica alemana, que llega a decir, en palabras de Marx, que la religión es el opio de los pueblos yeah. y la religión no es fundamento de vida. Yeah, uh, uh, he's talking about the course where we were told that the religion is the opio of the, of the, of the, of the masses. Um, and uh, there's a course for that, for that you... Yes, well, he was a social yeah. scientist. <laughs> I didn't have that one, but I have five other ones. <laughs> yeah. No, es que, es que desde niño, desde niño. Since, eh, since you are a child. Eh, todo el tiempo te vienen promoviendo en la escuela. Mm -hmm. Eso se llama ideologización política. Yeah, política, uh, uh, that's me now. <laughs> I have to go to um, boarding school since I was 11 years old. And it was the only choice in my time. I had to move to another town and go to boarding school away from my family and going through those type of, since um, middle school, we, we had to take no high level college degree courses on economics, of, so, but Vida Politica de mi Patria, it was the name, like political life of my country. Constantly, we had to be studying that. We have a number of very good questions coming in from the audience. Um, the first question is, in your opinions, what right do Americans, what rights or right does, do Americans take most for granted that the people of Cuba are missing? What do we take for granted? For granted, the, uh, oh. the freedom of expression. Is one. But I will add that actually, pretty much all of the human rights <laughs> Americans have for granted. Those are natural rights that came with the human beings that the Cuban people don't have. Uh, we don't have in Cuba uh, freedom of expression. There is no freedom of reunion, of association. There is Cuba have only one party. There's no anything else will be illegal. Um, you can uh, <laughs> you cannot criticize the the government in Cuba. Ripping a picture of Fidel Castro will take you years in jail. When, when you see here talking, people talking about Trump or talking about Biden, that, Americans take that for granted. Cuban cannot do that. It's so many that it's like, if you list human rights, natural rights that we have from God, those are, in Cuba are the right that Cuban have they understand have given by the government. The, the, the people that agree with the Cuban regime are grateful for the rights that the government are given them and don't realize that those are rights that belong to them. But What do you think America can do to help Cubans, uh, whether it's the government or the American people? What can we do? Divulgar. Get, mentir todo cuanto se dice y realmente no es así como funciona en la práctica. To get educated, to learn about the reality in Cuba. 
Um, one thing that happened in the United States is the, the political um, issue with Cuba is all um, and in Florida. Florida is a swing state. They has many Cubans. And then the government of the United States always treat Cuba through the prison of Florida. Then um, just being educated about what is the truth about Cuba. As I say, we, we emigrate here. You have to assume that we don't agree with the Cuba government. But get information from others as well. So you go ahead. Because there are many in the United States that some kind of affinity ideologically with the Cuban system could accept those things. Even when they will never accept those conditions to themselves, they think that it's fine in Cuba. And that has these ideas that in Cuba is fine. And then being educated about Cuba, and that's, I think, in my opinion, the best way to, to help Cuba. Yo, yo pudiera hablarle de, de una experiencia que yo tuve en, en, en Brasil, en la universidad. Un total de unos, en los cuatro años que estuve allá, organizamos por la universidad unos cuatro viajes de estudiantes y profesores. Pero era desde Brasil. He has experience, uh, it's the same situation with Brazil. Yeah. Trying to organize trips to Cuba to educate Brazilians about the Cuban situation as well. Because I just, this day is, uh, Americans are very aware of what is happening in Russia and in Ukraine. And I, I, it's, it's hard to make you know, comparison things, but you see the misinformation of Russia, how Russians support Putin, 80%. The American president has a 40% approval rating. Vladimir Putin has more than 80% of approval because it's the constant misinformation in Cuba is even more. Russia is a democracy compared with Cuba. Russia can vote for two or more parties. In Cuba, isn't, that's no choice. In Cuba, is even more. 24-7, the bombardment of information from the government to the Cuban people. And then it's, it's just for, for you to try to comprehend that level of information that they are bombarded. Compared with Russia, that maybe is in more, more in the news these days. We have another question. Um, both of you mentioned that um, people who speak out against the government may be imprisoned, but what other techniques does the government use to keep people quiet? Or maybe these propaganda methods, how do they keep them in the dark? Other cosas, además de poner en prisión, de que el gobierno usa para reprimir. Para reprimir? Sí, para, para ejemplo, doblarla. Déjeme decir una. Just to mention one, uh, one, one technique that the government used to control people is, for example, um, Cuba sent physicians and other um, teachers to other countries as a form of propaganda. And those Cubans that they sent to Venezuela, there are many, many doctors, physicians, in Venezuela, many, many physicians that are sent to Africa. They are sent to those countries without the family. They don't allow Cubans to go with the family. Because if they go with the family, they can escape. And then the way to control is having the family in Cuba. Many NGOs have considered this actions at going to outside and getting the payment for the government and paying pennies to Cuba for slavery. But that's, that's one of the ways that the government used to control. The other way is, is the physician abandoned their post where they were sent 
they are not allowed to go back to Cuba to see their family for many, many years. That's, yeah. Sí, yo me iba a referir a algo tan sencillo para que lo pudieran entender de una manera mucho más simple. En Cuba es prohibido escuchar la canción que da nombre a ah. este evento. Uh, one thing that to be very simple to understand, the song, or the, the theme of the song that the students were watching before this event is not allowed to, to be listened in Cuba. Um, the song is the um, Patri Vida is, uh, is the Grammy of last year. Uh, the song uh, comes with many uh, artists. Some are in Cuba and others are outside Cuba. And it's just talking about 60 years of the revolution, how this is, should be enough. And how they, they may play with the words it's a rap that they talk about. The way that Fidel Castro and the Cuban leader end their speech, like here in the United States, the president ends with God bless America. In Cuba is um, homeland or death, socialism or death, we will win. That is the end of the speeches. And they, they may play with that. With that. Yeah, it's about that it's time to say uh, homeland and life, that, that the country should include all. And it has become a um, you know, sound that, just to make an example, my father is in Cuba. He didn't know about the song. He only knew about that something was happening. And I, I called him and I have to play in my phone, go to YouTube, play the song, and share the screen with him for him to see the song that is a Cuban, because it's not allowed by the Cuban government to, to listen to. Then that song that you were able to share, very simple, simple act is illegal in Cuba. In the en el context universitario, for example, in a high, in a college context. Si, si usted es profesora de sociología, de economía, está dando una clase y tiene estudiantes que por su juventud precisamente demandan de soluciones a los problemas sociales. If you in Cuba are teaching economics or sociology and you have students that are questioning and asking for changes, y entran en un debate teórico acerca de la problemática social. And then you, you start a debate about those topics. Y esto evidentemente va a tener un responsable, o al menos la percepción de un responsable. Y ese responsable en el socialismo es el socialismo, es el gobierno, no, no, hay, no hay para dónde más. Ya tú no eres una buena profesora. And if is the conclusion of, the, of that discussion is that the responsible for the situation is the Cuban government, then you already are not considered a good professor. Constantemente, <laughs> and la rectoría de la escuela, de la universidad, te va a estar mandando a chequear las clases. And if the, the administration or the college find out, you will be checked constantly about what you are teaching. E incluso van a situar agentes de la seguridad dentro de tu clase. And they're going to put um, officers or the secret police in your class. Mm -hmm. Eso pasa en Cuba. That happened. Thank you. We have a question about your Christian faith. How has your personal Christian faith helped you and your family in your journey from Cuba to the United States? We don't cry. We don't want to cry again. <laughs> si llega, si vienes de Cuba, si has sido abusado en Cuba, en el ejercicio de tu profesión, y, y, y te tienes que exiliar, 
y comienzas a notar que un mundo existe fuera de Cuba y luego llegas a una ciudad como esta y si tu mayor fortaleza estuvo precisamente en la fe en tu familia pero ponderando todo eh, la fe cristiana y poniéndolo todo en sus manos if, if you have to leave your country uh, and all what that implies and arrive to a place like Holland and you have and you see how you are received and you see how things could be different and you see that through the present uh, that is the faith that is y llegas aquí yeah. y te encuentras a personas tan maravillosas como Noelia y Dona Nova yeah. And you find, you can hear and find people that he's pointing to, the one to help him when he arrives. Que abrieron los brazos, que te abrazaron como si te hubiesen conocido toda la vida. That they receive you with open arm, like they yeah. knew all the time, all your life. Tu, tu, tu fe se enraiza, tu fe se, se, se profundiza. Y It's cada a, día das gracias al Señor por cada día de vida mm -hmm. y por estar en, en un lugar como este. You thank God for all of those, and you know, it's, it's the center of where it reinforces your faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Y en compensación, ayudar. Yeah. And, ayudar a los otros. And in, in return, the idea that we have to help the one that's still there. Mm -hmm. We ha hear a lot about free health care and free education in Cuba. I wonder if you would speak to that. I just, I just want to talk a little bit. You know, that is very, we go into more ideological and political area. I'm just going to talk about my experience. I talk a little bit here what the, how being a student in Cuba means, yeah? And you have a free education, but you cannot have any other type of education in Cuba. And when the government take everything from the people, everything that you receive in Cuba is free. Because I receive a free education, but um, when I graduate as an engineer, I have to work in the place that the government told me to work for less than three dollars a month. And um, it's like my education was free, but I was working for free. Everything that my family had was taken. Then that idea of the free education, nobody here will take Cuba free education what that means. In order to provide free education for Cubans, nobody will take that. Similar with the free healthcare. Cuba has free healthcare, but was, there is not other type of healthcare in Cuba. Um, for example, um, today, my aunt is in Cuba waiting for a hip replacement. There's not going to be a way that she will get a hip replacement. She have, you have to pay a doctor, a crack doctor, because there is no other way to do it in Cuba. She's offering doctors more than 10 times what the doctor made in a whole year. And there is no way they can find a hip replacement. I remember that I was in Cuba and I, I contract a, a virus, a, a lectopirosis is the name of the disease. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct or not. But it's a bacteria, it's a bacteria that um, is fatal if you are not treated. And I remember when my mother took me to the hospital, it was nothing. It was a blackout. The hospital was dark. There was nothing to do a test on me. A family friend 
that the doctor said, you have a serious infection here, let's put you in penicillin, the only antibiotic. And my mother had to bring a lantern because we spent the night in the hospital and she had to check my IV with a lantern. And I remember the ER, that hospital, when I was with the lantern, I had to put a tractor pointing to the ER, the, the beams, the, the high beams of the, the car, the tractor, was the only light that the doctor had in the ER. Then it's, yes, it is free health care in Cuba. But nobody will take that free care if you are there. From far away, through the doctrine and all of the ideologies and all of the misinformation, people will say, yes, there is free health care in Cuba. But, um, yeah. I think that la education in Cuba and that ideal that many young people have de una de un país con educación y salud gratuita tiene una base histórica. He think that uh, the, the idea of youth uh, or some people considering the idea of free education and healthcare in Cuba have historical um, root. Pongamos por ejemplo 1959, año en que triunfó la revolución. It will go back to the year that the Cuban Revolution star, 1959. Two years later, Cuba had a cultural uh, revolution. Um, the revolution uh, um, made all Cubans, um, or most of Cubans, go through uh, literacy classes. Everybody need to know how to read. Pero la revolución cubana y su líder Fidel Castro comienza a vender un un estandarte, una bandera. Then Cuba start to sell that uh, as a flag. Yeah. Uh, de que era el el lo mejor, o sea, era el triunfo de la sociedad socialista cubana sobre el capitalismo decadente. That, that was a symbol of the, the socialist society will be triumphant against the capitalism that were in the in decadence. But it was false. O sea, Cuba estaba recibir Cuba recibía desde el año Cuba comenzó a recibir desde el, desde el mismísimo año 61 3 mil millones de dólares que eran enviados desde el Kremlin, Rusia. But that was a front because it was done with the support for the, from the Soviet Union at that time as a propaganda for the region. Y que casi todo ese dinero Fidel lo invertía en estos aspectos de carácter social como la educación y la salud. And one of the ideas was to um, spend the money from, from the Soviet Union in education and health care. Mm -hmm. Evidentemente, Estamos hablando de ayuda, no estamos hablando de resultados trabajados con el esfuerzo diario. Sí, para que la gente... Yeah. <laughs> sí, sí. I don't know how to translate no, that. No, sí. Yeah, that was more... La ayuda que recibía de Rusia, no lo que se hacía en el país. That, that was more about the money coming from Russia, but no as a result of the development of the Cuba society or structures. Y evidentemente, la pedagogía cubana fue alcanzando... Altos niveles de desarrollo. And uh, Cuba started to get high level of education. Y se convirtió en la bandera de toda la izquierda latinoamericana. To, to became like the flag or the standard for all of the left of the Latin American countries. La verdad es que eso, en el año 91, en el año 90, 91, cuando se derrumba el socialismo europeo, el este europeo. But when the the West, or the East, <laughs> in Europe, collapsed, the, the Soviet Union collapsed, and the, that helps stop coming to Cuba. El sistema educativo se fue al piso. Yeah, La they, salud pública 
the education and the healthcare in Cuba didn't have the, um, the development to sustain without the Russian. And the, the whole Cuban economic system. Hay, hay un dato importante que es, lo, lo, es acerca del dato que da la UNESCO. He is talking about a, a UNESCO data about Cuba. Sí, cuando la UNESCO refiere, cuando la, la, la UNESCO the, refiere que Cuba, the UN have some data from Cuba, dedica el 10 y el 11 por ciento de su producto interno bruto a la educación y a la salud. They say that Cuba uh, uh, use um, 10, 10% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. La Organización Mundial de la Salud. They, they use that percent of the GDP to health and education. Habla de que un 6% es lo máximo. De que un 6% del producto interno there is another organization that put a 6%. Yeah. Yeah, la, la de la salud da ese dato the como, como el WHO, yeah, is the World Health Organization, put it at 6%. That is like the WHO put the numbers half of what the Cuban government says that. Yeah. And, and, they, como la Unión Europea, and the European Union and oh, first, they're putting a 4% of their que está pasando con, con Cuba es que se descapitaliza y no hay desarrollo económico porque no se influye o no se invierte en las otras áreas de desarrollo económico como la industrialización que tiene que tener el país. In Cuba there is a problem that uh, the, the lack of in investment in that area or in any other area because there is no investment, there's no capital, no capital. Yeah. One last question off of Slido. Um, what are some positive things going on in Cuba or do you see um, positive things? What is your source of hope for Cuba? Uh, uh, what I think that is positive in these days in Cuba is is better now that was when when I grew up. Um, the ideological control of the people is not as tight as it was before. The internet the, um, it became harder and harder for the Cuban government to control the information, to control what, what the people in Cuba see. Now they have phones, they can talk. They even, for example, when these uh, rallies were happening in Cuba, um, I was talking with my aunt and my aunt said they're gonna cut the phone for five days, see you on the other side because we couldn't talk for during the rallies. We, they had no service, and then we would talk after that. But but they have something. In my time, there was nothing. Uh, the only way that I had to get the information was using a radio. The the Boys of America, that's what I used when I was uh, your age. In a very small radio, listening to the Boys of America. And sometimes we get in Cuba, uh, AM stations from, from Miami. I knew all of the highways of Florida because I, I had the traffic in the Palmetto and the <laughs> Never in Florida, but I was listening to the traffic report <laughs> and all of the things. And now the government have less control. Of that. That's, that's positive. And the exchange with people and things, and it's, there's no way. 
hay una frase de humorista eh, del cubano y me voy a referir al pueblo cubano. It's just remembering a comedian in Cuba. Uh, que dice que el cubano abre la puerta del refrigerador, no ve nada, pero se parte de la risa. The, it's talking about how a Cuban opens the refrigerator, doesn't see anything in the refrigerator, but laugh. Because we have learned how to live with um, nothing, with a very, a very little. Es un virus, ha mutado. Es una mutación. Sí, sí, <laughs> hemos, hemos sabido eh, eh, mantener la idiosincrasia. We have been able to keep the culture, the, la unidad the, de la familia, the family, the unity of the family, the, las tradiciones, the traditions, um, y la historia. Uh, our history. La historia que va más allá de la del 59. The history is going beyond the one that started with the revolution in 59. De una historia que en el 59 alumbró a todo un continente, pero que luego torció el rumbo. The, the one history that in 59 was the hope of the whole continent, but changed course. Desconocer que los procesos que se dieron en la Cuba de los años de los, del principio de la revolución fueron progresistas, fueron cambios progresistas, es, es de conocer la historia. Think the, thinking that the beginning of the revolution was a progress is, it's just not very, very aware of the history. Esto luego se, se, se cambió el rumbo. Cuba changed course. And then, and then. Pero cuando el, el cubano hoy, de las cosas positivas que podemos a, a, amar del cubano, es precisamente su hospitalidad. One thing that we can appreciate of the Cuban people is the hospitality. The, su bondad, lo familiar que mm, es. How familiar and the love for extremadamente the, alegre por cualquier cosa en una fiesta. Very, very happy. And, That's uh, the, the, they're organizing parties very quick. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is the culture. Le gusta the, bailar mucho. The dance, the culture, yeah. Y disfrutan mucho, y disfrutan mucho la, lo que como oportunidad hoy yo veo a la sociedad cubana. Eso en el plano, en el plano más... Eh, más popular, en el plano más popular, lo que estoy diciendo. Pero como oportunidad hoy en lo social, el acceso a los medios de información. Yeah. He's just talking how the access to the, the communications is, is eso important. Permite, le permite ver lo que era negado, ver. Yeah. Cuba now can see what it was not. Y de cierta manera yeah. decir lo que le era prohibido. And we can say what it was. Uh, forbidden before. Y eso, y eso necesariamente eh, va a hablar de un cambio en los próximos años. And that uh, we hope that will lead to change in the future. Nadie imaginaba que cinco años atrás en Cuba se pudiera haber dado una manifestación como la que se hizo el 5 de julio. Five years ago, nobody could imagine that Cubans will get out on the street to protest. That happened last year donde más de 25 territorios a lo largo de todo el país More than 25 places, um, se pronunciaron en contra del gobierno. Uh, have a rally uh, uh, against the government. Mm -hmm. Esperemos que su futuro sea luminoso. And we hope that the future is better. Thank you both so much for sharing. You've been so generous with your time, sharing from your brilliant minds, and most of all, from your hearts. We just appreciate you very much. Please join me in, in thanking our panelists.
And thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Talk to you more if okay, you have time. Okay. Um, they